Morning, Grace. We are, as you know, in the midst of a series entitled Incarnate. Uh, as we've been talking about what it looks like for us as a church to be transformed for the sake of others, just as Jesus was transformed, meaning taking on a human flesh uh, in order to redeem us, we are now, as his church, to enact that same thing in our world today. In the last several weeks, we've been examining one aspect of our calling as Christians, and that's to proclaim Christ's coming kingdom, to tell others about him and how they can be part of that kingdom. And, and so we've been talking about how we can engage each other in conversations and, and spend time with people who maybe have questions or even been hurt by people who associate with God or Christians and how we can begin to engage them and have conversations with them about that, how that's an important part of our calling. Uh, today we transition to the second half of this series, which is going to talk about demonstrating his kingdom proclaiming his kingdom, telling others about him, and demonstrating his kingdom, meaning living in such a way that people see a glimpse of what that coming kingdom is going to be like uh, here on earth, even as imperfect as it is. So uh, as we make that transition, we're gonna look at a passage today in which God was talking to his people during a season uh, where they were really missing out on the fullness of his presence. In fact, he felt like he was absent from them. And he's going to talk to them, as he talks to us even today, about what it is, what kind of worship. They were worshiping him then. They were going through all kinds of religious motions, but God seemed to be distant from them. And we're going to see in our passage today, uh, what kind of worship does God simply reject? He doesn't accept it. And then what are two characteristics of worship that invites his presence and his power and his light and changing and healing in your lives. And over the next several months, we're gonna examine what that looks like and how we as individuals and as we as a church can take steps towards becoming those kinds of people, letting him change us into those kinds of people and becoming that kind of church in our community. So I'm very excited about this. I think this is gonna be a transformational aspect in our church and in our lives individually. I know God's been speaking to me in a lot of ways about these things today uh, in the last over the months as we've been preparing for this. Uh, but today we're going to look at a passage in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 58. And today and, and next week we're going to take a look at this whole chapter. Today we're going to look at these principles as I talked about. Next week we're going to look at the results of them. What would it look like? What does God promise when a people choose to obey him and engage with him in the way that he has called us to, to follow him the way he wants us to follow him. So Isaiah 58, we'll look at the first seven verses today, uh, looking at what this, these principles are, uh, and then the last half of the chapter next week. We'll pray in a minute, but let me give you a little background. Isaiah is a prophet that prophesied uh, prior to Israel going into exile, when uh, the northern kingdom went into exile, and then later, uh, a few hundred years later, the southern kingdom went into exile, he was prophesying to God's people, telling them, return to the ways that I've called you to worship me, or else you're going to experience this judgment. You're going to experience this discipline from the Lord. If you remember how we started this series in Micah, uh, looking at the kind of worship God desires of being uh, doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with our God, those principles you're going to see woven into Isaiah's message as well, because Isaiah and Micah were contemporaries. They prophesied at the same time, and God's people were struggling with the same issues. So a lot of their message is very similar, because those are the issues God was addressing with his people. Isaiah spoke these words that we're looking at uh, to an audience that would actually be in exile. The first 39 chapters of his, of his book uh, we're spoken to the people saying, this is what you need to do. This is what's coming if you don't repent and obey. The last uh, several chapters from chapter 40 to 66 were spoken to God's people for the future of when they were going to be in exile because he knew it was coming. They would be words of encouragement to say, when you are in exile, as God told them, and you repent and you return to me when you're living in these foreign nations, I will come back to you and I will restore you back to your land. And you will experience my presence as they did back then through the temple where God chose to manifest his presence. Now we see that in the Holy Spirit. 
But sometimes, as we can learn in the New Testament, we quench the Holy Spirit. We thwart his work in our life, or we stop it from happening the way God would want it to because we aren't in obedience to him. And so this message to them is very similar to the message God has for us. Oftentimes, we lack the presence of God, not that he's not with us, but the fullness of his presence in our life because we aren't willing to trust him and obey him as he's called us to. So my prayer is that we as a church respond to these truths that God shared uh, many, many years ago, but still apply to us today. Let's pray, and we'll dig into this passage and see what it has to say to us today. Father God, we're so thankful for the words that you've not just given to us as a people, but you've preserved for us. Lord, there is no other book in all the world that compares to this book. Just think about what we hold in our hands. Lord, you could not touch in any museum a book as ancient as this book. Words that had been written thousands of years ago would be kept behind glass cases and and put in places where no person could go and touch and see, and yet, Lord, the uniqueness of your word is that people have penned your words throughout time, different people of all different statuses in life, throughout different periods, and the same message has come through, and we can hold them here in our hands, words that you spoke to your people many, many years ago. And the fact that they still apply today shows that it was no man who simply wrote these words. It was you inspiring them speaking through them because they cut right to our heart like one who knows us better than we know ourselves. Lord, we pray you would speak to us today like you spoke to them in Isaiah's day. And Lord, that we would respond unlike them who continued in their rebellion and experienced your loving discipline. May we respond in humility and experience the promises that we'll look at next week for our sake, for your glory, and for the sake of our community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Isaiah 58, we'll start off in verse one. We'll read the first five verses and take a look at what God's saying there in terms of the kind of worship he rejects. And then we'll see two aspects of worship that please him and invite his presence into our lives in a unique way. Isaiah 58 1 says this, cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Now, one thing you gotta understand about the prophets is they often speak in charged poetic language. So you gotta understand poetic imagery and poetry in general to to glean the message behind it. And so God's speaking through Isaiah, but he's telling him, Isaiah, lift up your voice, trumpet it out, speak it out in a way that everyone can hear it. Kind of like a battle cry. This is a message that all my people need to hear. And that message is about their transgressions, the house of Jacob, their sins. He's repeating the same thing. Tell my people their transgressions. The house of Jacob, Jacob was the father of Israel, the one whom all the Israelites came from, their transgressions. He's just viewing poetic parallelism to emphasize the fact that you need to tell them what's going on and what's going to happen. Okay, so then he goes into uh, the state of their people. He says, yet they seek me daily... Now it's describing the Israelites. Even though I'm telling them their transgressions, they seek me daily. They even delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to me. And then they ask these questions. This is Israel now, in a sense, speaking to God. Why have we fasted and you not see it? Now, in this passage, you're gonna see the word fast used a lot. It's not talking specifically just about a fast like going without. It's, a, again, a, a poetic a metaphor where you use part of some, something that's larger to describe it. Kind of like if I were to say to my buddy, hey, go grab your wheels and let's take off and go to San Antonio. You know how we do that? What am I referring to when I say the wheels? 
I'm referring to the whole car. Okay, this is the same thing. It's a, a metaphor, a, a, an expression, where you're using part of something to refer to the whole, okay? You're going to see this term throughout this passage. So it's not just about fasting he's talking about. He's talking about their worship because fasting was part of their overall worship. So you might substitute in your head uh, worship. Why have we worshipped you and, and see it? and you see it not, meaning God's not responding to our worship. Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? And God responds, behold, he says, in the day of your fast or in the day of your worship, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, your worship or your fast, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist Fasting or worship like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. What's he saying there? What's he telling us about God? That if we worship in the wrong way, God's not going to hear us. He's not going to even listen to our prayers. He hears them physically. He knows what we're saying. But in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, to hear something meant you not just hear it, but you respond to it. You react to it. You do something about it. And then he goes on to ask these questions. He says, is the fast or worship that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it just to bow down his head like a reed? and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him. He's talking about the different forms in which they would worship. He says, will you call this a, a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Now in the, the Hebrew, you don't see it in the English, but in the Hebrew uh, phrases, they could ask a question like this, and at the beginning of the sentence, they could put a little uh, word in there, either a yes or a no, like a C or a no in, the, in front of a sentence, right? And it would tell you what answer the person was expecting. And in the Hebrew, in this sentence, the word no is put at the beginning of this question. It's a rhetorical question. And anyone reading it would have said, uh, is such the day that I choose? Is it a day for a person to humble himself? The answer is no. This is not the kind of fast I'm looking for. This is not the kind of worship that God is seeking. And yet the people are saying, what gives? I mean, why aren't you acknowledging any of our religious acts? Well, he tells them, because their religious acts are done out of selfishness. They're purely looking out for their own interests. They're coming, really using it as leverage against God to get God what they want him to do rather than seeking what he wants them to do. They're coming seeking pleasure, and yet at the same time, they're oppressing others. They were causing, and in the Sabbath for them, they were to go and worship, but the Sabbath was not just for the Israelites, it was for all their workers as well, and even their animals. So what was going on is, while they were going and worshiping, they were having their, their servants and their animals and everything continue to work because that would benefit them. They didn't care about how other people we're approaching God or having the opportunity to worship God. All they cared about was, as long as I get my day and I, and I get there and the songs that I want to sing are sung and everyone's there to serve my, my family and make sure all my needs are met, then it's been a good day of worship. Their whole mindset in coming to worship was all about themselves. And God was saying, this is the kind of worship that I won't even listen to. You can continue to go through the motions. You can schedule it every single week and look really religious on the outside. But if your worship is neglecting the very heart of why I call you to worship, then I'll have nothing to do with it. It says they're quarrelsome and they're de divisive. They're arguing with one another. Uh, we, don't we still see this today? I mean, we've all been in churches, probably this church even as well. You wonder, man, how can we come here and worship? How can we talk about unity? And then I can hear gossip, one person slandering another, or people divided over some issue. They won't sit down and work it out. Many of us have been in churches or maybe been hurt by churches that did that. I want you to know that is not worship. That is not what God has called us to do, nor is it who he's called us to be. And when we do that, it's deeply 
displeasing to him. So much so that he says, that's it. I won't even listen anymore. Until you obey the basic commands, until you understand that you come to me as your God seeking justice, seeking restoration. You come as a poor and needy people wanting me to reach down and be kind to you and meet your needs and help you out. And yet you turn the next moment and oppress and hurt another one of my children. And so he says, I close my ears. I won't even hear the prayers of these people. I think of the different ways I see this happen in the church today. When you act unjustly in your business or your workplace or in your school or your classroom, you need to know that you slam the door on God's presence in your life. God doesn't say this in a judgmental, condemning way. He says it in a pleading, father-like way, saying, don't act this way because it turns my ear from hearing your requests. Instead, he says, act justly, treat people fairly, operate your business in a way that's kingdom-minded, that manifests the character of my son on this earth, even if it costs you more to do so. When you do so, you invite my presence into your business. When men oppress women through unfaithful behavior in your marriage or neglecting alimony you owe from a past relationship or you withhold your physical or emotional or spiritual presence in the life of your family, you slam the door on God's presence and power in your life. When you take advantage of underprivileged workers or immigrants or neglect to fair pay in order to make an extra profit, you slam the door on God's presence and power in your life. When you speak unjustly or slanderously about another person, or equally evil, when you fail to speak out and speak up about an evil or a harm that's going on in your life, in your family, or or in a place around you, you slam the door on God's presence and power in your life. When you come to worship simply seeking your own pleasure, your own comfort, rather than coming to humbly submit to God and obey what is best for our body, you slam the door on God's presence and power in your life. When you're quarrelsome and divisive and you refuse to be a peacemaker, you refuse to pursue unity the way God calls us to pursue unity, you slam the door on the power and presence of God in your life. This is the kind of worship that prevents God from hearing our prayers. Let me give you this simple point that kind of summarizes it. And what Isaiah is saying here is worship that neglects treating others justly is rejected by God. Worship that neglects treating others justly is rejected by God. This is not the kind of worship God asked for. And, and unfortunately, this is our, our, our human nature. It's hard to do these other things because it really involves trust. It's, really, it's, it's easy to show up to church on Sunday. I mean, that's an hour or so a week. Okay, God, I'll, I'll give you this. You know what's difficult is to give him your whole life. As, as Romans 12, 1 says, to offer your life as a living sacrifice, pleasing to him. So that's what we naturally do. And and, and I'm just as prone to this, people. This challenge is my heart as much as anyone's here. Our human nature, our fallen nature is, okay, let me go through the motions, let me do church. I'll add add a small group. Then God's gonna really owe me if I go to small group during the week. I mean, come on, God, you got two days out of my week now? Maybe I'll drop a little something in the offering. If he's gotta bless me now. Don't we play that game often? 
pastors, here's what we do. Oh man, God, our schedules, we take phone calls all the time, we're doing all this. Man, God, if you, you, do you know how much I'm giving for your church? Yeah, this is a conversation I often have in my, when I'm feeling you know, like a pity party. Come on, God, you owe me, can't you just give me the iPhone 5? I mean, I've had this old beat up phone forever. That's all I'm asking for. It's really gonna help me do ministry better. It's pretty pathetic, isn't it? But it happens to all of us. But Isaiah goes on then to talk about what kind of worship God responds to. Two principles, two aspects that he says will please him. And he asks it in the form of questions. But what's unique in these questions is unlike the questions in verse five that had the answer no to him, in this section in the Hebrew, the writer puts the word yes at the beginning of the question in the Hebrew. The answer to all these questions is a rhetorical yes. This is exactly what I want. So listen to what he says is the first principle about worship that pleases God. In verse six it says this, is not this the fast or the worship that I choose? Here's the kind of worship that God chooses and he lists several things here. He says, to loose the bonds of wickedness. We'll talk about what that means. To undo the straps of the yoke. To let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Okay, so now here's these poetic images. And remember, this is poetry, so it's understanding what do these images mean? What are they referring to? How would they have understood them when they heard them? So here's the, the general point, and then we'll flesh it out. That true worship, God is saying, involves freedom from sinful oppression. True worship involves freedom from sinful oppression. That's what Jesus came to do for you and I to free us from the sinful oppression that had come into this world because of the very first man's choice, Adam's, to rebel against God. And ever since then, the world's been under a curse. It's been under the power of the prince and the power of this heir, the devil, who wants nothing more to oppress and put a yoke on the people whom are gods. And Jesus came to turn that around. Freedom from sin... We see in this passage is the first one, to loose the bonds of wickedness. That's really what it's talking about, that we're all dead to to holiness, as Paul talks about. We're dead in our lives. Our spiritual lives are dead apart from God. We're born with a sinful nature. We're bonded to sin. We can't help but sin. You don't ever, we have five kids. You know what I've never done with any five of our kids? I've never sat down and said, let me give you the basic principles of how to lie to your parents, how to sneak around, how to uh, be rebellious, how to reject their authority. Have any of you done that? No. My parents didn't have to do it for me. Why? Because that's what I naturally do. And what often happens is in our religion, we just turn it over to religion and say, okay, I'll just sneak around with God and now good things will happen to me. We apply the same selfish principles and to doing good things, but we're really doing it for the same reasons. We haven't really been transformed on the inside to a new nature that says, I don't want to sin anymore. Yes, it's still a temptation. You can struggle with it at times, but it's not what I desire anymore. That's being free. That's what Paul says when he talked in Romans 6 of setting us free from the power of sin in our lives. No longer does it dominate us. It's setting us free from this kind of oppression, that kind of wickedness. That's what God wants to see in worship. That's the kind of worship that pleases him. That's why one of the reasons I think he smiles down and blesses this church so much, even though we're just kind of a unique church jammed into this building and and coming here every week, is because we constantly are seeing people who are trust in Jesus Christ being set free from the damaging sinful patterns of their past because all of us have experienced that, myself included. That pleases him. And if we're going to please him in our worship, then we can never stop engaging with people in our community who are in bondage to sin. We can never become a church that says, hey, it's comfortable now. There's no sinners in here. (laughs) Yeah, whatever, right? You know what? I I love what one pastor used to say. He said, "If if you knew the sin that your pastor was capable of, you wouldn't come to church on Sunday and listen to him. But 
if I knew all the sin that you were engaged in, we wouldn't let you in the building. <laughs> it's a beautiful truth that just reminds us of where each of us has come from. And worship that pleases God is worship that's constantly stepping out into its community, into its neighborhood, into its family, and seeing those people who are still in bondage to sin like we were, and meeting those needs, engaging them and freeing them. It's a, a worship, as he says here, that undoes the straps of the yoke. That image uh, was an image they would use in an agricultural society where you'd put a yoke, a double yoke over a uh, um, an ox, and that ox would pull the plow. And that yoke was intended to force that ox to do certain things. You could guide them, you could gear them, but it was inhibiting to them. It put them under forced labor. And this image here he's using of a yoke is, is people who are strapped and, and others who don't have their best interests in mind are forcing them to do things and, and pushing in their lives and, and causing things in their lives that are not good for them. And he's saying worship that pleases him are, are people that help free others from the negative, sinful yokes that exist in their community, in their family, in their homes, so that we're no longer in forced labor, so to speak, for the wrong side. And then he says breaking, uh, the, undoing the straps of the yoke, letting the oppressed go free, that's kind of the same image, and breaking every yoke. If you think of the yokes as those oppressive structures that exist even in a home, Maybe if you're in a home with a, uh, a father or a mother or whatever, the child that that's, has behaviors that are oppressive to the family, what God wants to see us do is pray for and intercede and break those systems so that no one experiences that kind of pain again. I think of our country as a, a nation and the history of, of ours and the slavery that existed in the past. That was a yoke. Christians that condoned that kind of behavior was detestable in God's eyes. And we needed to break that system and have men like Abraham Lincoln that fought and, and suffered intensely, incredible reviling. But his heart was to break that. Every one of those things, you can go back and see the history of Christian men who said, this should not be happening. And they spent their lives breaking those yokes so that no one would have to experience the oppression that comes with it. I think in our culture, in our city, a culture of bribery that exists, where if you have resources, you can tweak the justice system. People, that's a yoke we need to break. And we start by not giving into it ourselves by not letting someone buy your character. It's worth way too much. I think of the oppression we have here against women and the, and the way many men in our culture and our community act and the abuse that goes along with that. We need to speak up against that. We need to love those men but confront them who are living in that sort of manner and oppressing and harming women, harming wives, harming families and children who grow up under that yoke and continue to see the damage as it's passed down from generation to generation to generation. We can break that. God can break that if we will act like his people. See, when my worship sets others free from their sin, rather than condemning them for it, that's when I'm worshiping. And the reason justice is imperative to our worship is because it's what we seek in our worship. It's what we go after when we come into God's presence. It's what we want from him, don't we? Don't we go to God saying, God, this isn't fair. God, why is this happening in my life? God, I need you here. I need you to take care of this. I have a need here. We do this all the time with God. And why he doesn't hear us is because after we sit in his presence and cry out to him and ask him to meet these needs or to change the system or stop the sin that's harming us, we turn around and walk out the door and we do the exact same thing or we condone the exact same behaviors that we just got done asking him to change. 
Why would he listen? Unless we're willing to be changed ourselves. Third thing we see in this passage comes in verse 7. He says, is it not, again, with the answer yes assumed in each of these, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? The third principle, or the second principle that we are to see in our worship is not just worship that involves freedom from sinful oppression, but true worship involves serving those in need. Serving those in need. See, when we come as a needy people to God in worship and he meets us in our need, it transforms us to see and engage the needs in others around us. I think one of the problems we face in this area is is maybe we've never truly met God in the deepest time of our need. Maybe we've just taken on a religious system rather than followed a a, a holy, infinitely good Savior. And we don't see ourselves as needy. We don't approach him as one that's needy. And so when he meets that need, we're not overwhelmed with it. We think he owes us something rather than us going, man, I owe you everything. And when we meet God in that way, when we engage him in that guy that way, when that's a regular part of how we worship him, It transforms us little by little to see the needs of people around us and want to engage and meet them as well. So how can I do this? I want to just give you this one little phrase. Maybe write this down. It's not going to come up on the screen. And we'll flesh this out over the weeks to come. How can I possibly meet these needs? There's so many needs. There's needs all over me. They're they're overwhelming. I want to give you a phrase that I learned from a Uh, Andy Stanley, who uses it in his organization in a different way, but the phrase just rings in my head a lot, and that's this. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. See, this avoids us being paralyzed from doing anything. We often think, oh, problems are so big. What, What difference will my small part make? That's not the question God asks. He says, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Just start. It also avoids the false guilt of feeling like you should do everything uh, because you can't. You're a limited human being. Even Jesus, when he was here on human form and human flesh on earth, did not heal every person he walked by. He did not alleviate every form of poverty in his day. But he always did for one what he had planned to do for everyone. We are called to do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. Why should we do for one what we wish he could do for everyone? Well, it's because God did to one what he should have done to everyone. God did to one what he should have done to everyone. After his own son lived a perfect, sinless life, after he earned the merit and favor of God, his presence, and even his eternal presence forever, Jesus deserved heaven. But instead, he experienced the wrath of his father. He experienced as one what you and I should have all experienced. God did to one what he should have done to all of us. He should have turned his back on all of us like we did to him. He should have punished all of us. He should have separated us forever from him. But instead, he did that to his own son. He did to one what he should have done to everyone so that you and I can do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. Jesus stepped down out of the riches of heaven to meet us in our poverty. He stepped out of the perfect justice of heaven to take an injustice for you and me so that you and I could stand justly before him. 
even though we don't deserve it. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then the most important decision you can make is to follow him, to trust that he did for you what we could never do for ourselves. You'll never get there through religious practice. As good as these things are, they're an expression of what's taken place in our hearts when we follow Jesus as our Savior. So today as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, I want you to remember as you hold the bread, as you hold the cup, that God did to his own son what he should have done to all of us so that he could offer to us, all of us, what should have been only for his son. As you hold the bread in your hand, remember that God sent one to take on human flesh, one to become poor, one to resist every temptation that you and I face so that that one could be broken for you and me. That one could make it possible for everyone who trusts in him to receive eternal life. Thank you, Jesus, for offering your life for us. Let's take the bread. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup and, and symbolizing the fact that he didn't just live a perfect life because a perfect life wouldn't have helped us. A sacrifice was needed. A payment for sin was required. And so this cup represents his blood, the sacrifice that he made for you and for me so that everyone who believes in him could have eternal life, the forgiveness of his sins. And as we take it, we do so in remembrance of him. Lord Jesus, we just bow to acknowledge the fact that we can't just add another religious deed to our list of deeds. We need to be changed in our hearts. Lord, we need to be overwhelmed with the sense of the grace and goodness you offered to us so that it changes us from the inside. It causes us to live differently, to think differently, to feel differently. And Lord, we need you to do that. As we worship you this morning, I pray that you begin in us a work that will change our lives forever, that will change this church forever, and it will change this community forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.